Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, and welcome to the second session of the 2022 LCU Strauss Worldview Lectureship, which honors Dr. James D. Strauss and his long career here at and impact on Lincoln Christian University. Dr. Strauss served as a professor of theology and philosophy from 1967 to 1994 and was instrumental in encouraging the development of Christian worldview studies as he argued that we should take every thought captive through the lens of a Christian worldview. The 2022 lectureship features Dr. Gary Selby, a professor of ministerial formation at Emanuel Christian Seminary at Milligan University in Johnson, Tennessee. He has had a long career of teaching at Pepperdine University, George Washington University, and Emanuel Christian Seminary. He is a teacher and devout churchman who served local congregations in Maryland and is now an active member at Hopwood Christian Church in Johnson City. A recent Milligan graduate told me that in addition to his considerable academic expertise, he's very kind, nuanced, thoughtful, generous, and is a great addition to the Hopwood Choir. Dr. Selby continues his lectureship now with Lift Up Your Eyes, Navigating the Loss of Transcendence. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Gary Selby. Thank you. Thank you again for being here. Um, before I begin, we're going to um, we're going to send around a bag of Hershey's Kisses, so you get a special reward for coming. And but I'm going to ask you, um, just take it and don't eat it yet. Don't do anything with it. Just set it on your uh, on your desk there, and maybe there are enough for two. Okay, um, and I'll I'll give you instructions in a few minutes. First of all, though, I'd like to begin with a reading from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 26. Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? The Lord who brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each of them by name. Because of God's great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Why do you complain, Jacob? Why do you say, Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord? My cause is disregarded by my God. Isaiah is urging us to look up, to open our eyes, to lift up our eyes, to see the beauty and grandeur and vastness of the cosmos, to be swept up in that, to be moved by it and to see in it the presence and the faithfulness of God. And that, in a way, is what Lewis is doing, C.S. Lewis, inviting us to be attentive to beauty, to pleasure, and to lift up our eyes to the goodness and presence of God. Now, I want to make this really, really practical to you. And so that's the purpose of the Hershey's Kiss. So here's what we're going to do for just a moment. This is often how I will introduce C.S. Lewis, um, uh, Letters to Malcolm, Letter 17, by mindfully eating a Hershey's Kiss. So to begin, I'm going to invite you just to take a deep breath, relax a little bit, you know, soften the face, soft gaze. Just a deep breath or two. And then go ahead and just pick up your Hershey's Kiss. You can close your eyes if you want and just, um, just roll it around in your fingers. Just feel the texture just a little bit. And then go ahead and, um, without opening, just smell it. See if you can catch a scent of that the smell of chocolate. And then go ahead and just peel that foil back and then smell it. The smell of chocolate should be a little stronger now. Pay attention to what's happening in your body, in your mouth. You're probably salivating. I'm salivating just thinking about it. And then when I tell you, not yet, but when I tell you, go ahead and open it. And when I tell you to, just go ahead and put it on your tongue and close your mouth around it. You'll feel a, an urge to chew. Don't do that just yet. 
So go ahead now and put it on your tongue. And close your mouth around it. Just pay attention to all the sensations of smell and taste. And then you can go ahead and finish eating your Hershey's Kiss. It's pretty good chocolate, isn't it? Have you ever, like a couple of hours after lunch, said, did I even eat lunch? Think about how often we just blow through eating. And, and so this is a little experience of being carefully attentive. Something that you can do, and I, I do this with students, I've done this with groups, I've done this in retreats, just to give people a moment of, of what it means to be attentive to a really small pleasure. And then to turn your attention to God in the prayer that says, God, how wonderful you are to have created this and to have created us with the capacity to enjoy something as small as a little Hershey's kiss. Now again, um, I'm taking as my outline for these talks um, C.S. Lewis's Letters to Malcolm, Letter 17. And um, in the first talk, I, I talked a little bit about how Lewis was struggling with what it meant to adore God, to worship God in prayer. It's like he says, I know I'm supposed to do that, but I, it doesn't seem to be working. And what he's trying to do is he's trying to summon up doctrines and precepts of our theology, propositional abstractions about God, the goodness and greatness of God. He's trying to, to conjure up some spiritual fervor in response to those theological propositions, and the dial is just not moving. And they're out for a walk on a hot day. Malcolm turns to the brook, he says, and once more splashes his burning face and asks the question, why not begin with this? And then and Lewis says, and it worked. And he says that that experience introduced him to the far more secret doctrine that our experiences of beauty and pleasure are shafts of the glory of God as it strikes our sensibilities. And in that, I think Lewis is capturing the mystical experience in some way. We're no longer thinking about God. We're in the presence of God. We are viscerally, non-discursively present to the glory. And then he says this, if I could always be what I aim at being, no pleasure would be too ordinary or too usual for such reception. From the first taste of the air when I look out of the window, one's whole cheek becomes a sort of palate down to one's soft slippers at bedtime. And what I think Lewis is doing is inviting us into the possibility of glimpsing in mundane, everyday experiences of beauty and pleasure what Isaiah and Ezekiel and Jesus experienced in the presence of God. And it's a possibility centered in the careful, worshipful attention to beauty. But then notice what he says in the next breath. He says, I don't always achieve it. One object is inattention. Another is the wrong kind of attention. One could, if one practiced, hear simply a roar and not the roaring of the wind. In the same way, only far too easily, one can concentrate on the pleasure as an event in one's own nervous system, subjectify it, and ignore the smell of deity that hangs about it. That's just eating the chocolate without giving glory to God. A third obstacle is greed. Instead of saying, this also is thou, one may say the fatal word, encore. There's also conceit, the dangerous reflection that not everyone can find God in a plain slice of bread and butter, or that others um, would condemn as simply gray, the sky in which I am delightedly observing such delicacies of pearl and dove and silver. 
So why don't we do this? It seems so simple, and it seems so obvious. Well, the problem, Lewis says, lies in our lack of attention. That's the problem, our lack of attention. And part of that might just be distraction, just the busyness that keeps us from noticing uh, the simple, beautiful pleasures and, and beauty all around us. But it might also be a focus on the pleasurable event as only a physical sensation in a way that ignores the smell of deity around it. And this might be a kind of hedonism, but it might also be the kind of reductionism that says there is nothing beyond this sensory experience. Of course, there's the fatal word encore, where instead of worshiping, we merely grab another piece of cake. And finally, there is the entrance of pride, where we stop paying attention to the pleasure and the presence of God, and we start paying attention to our own piety. But you see, the problem in every case is a problem of attention. Something is keeping us from being present to the beauty, to the pleasure, to the presence of God to which the pleasure points us. And that's what I want to focus on in this talk. What is it that keeps us from the mysticism for the rest of us? And especially, what is going on in our culture that prevents the, this kind of mystical attentiveness to the presence of God. Because to evoke the language of Isaiah, in our culture, we don't look up. We tend to look down. And I want to explore what that means and how that happens and a little of how we got here. You might think about this talk in this way. If you ever go to, I, I did this yesterday, I was in the airport um, in uh, Dallas, in Terminal E, and I want to find something to eat. So I go to that map uh, that shows all the restaurants, and I look for the little red arrow that says, you are here, okay? I want to find out where I am, and then I can see where I want to go. So that's what this talk is really about. This is the talk that tries to look at the map and say, you are here. Um, I teach ministry. I teach preaching, and I teach ministerial formation, and I teach leadership, and I teach spiritual formation, I'm, and I'm, I'm trying to get a sense, uh, because I'm teaching students to go out and do ministry, what's going on in our culture? What is the culture that you are going out in to do ministry? And so that's what I want to try to do in this talk for just a few minutes. To begin, I want to tell you about a conversation I witnessed a number of years ago uh, when I attended a Veritas Forum, um, a gathering that featured two speakers. One was a guy named Michael Shermer. Uh, he's the publisher of Skeptic Magazine. And the other was a, uh, John Polkinghorne. You may have heard of John Polkinghorne. He was a prize-winning physicist. And then when he retired, he became an Anglican priest. Um, so it's like, man, a couple great minds on the stage talking about faith. And they were talking about the human impulse toward morality. What is it that causes us to aspire to the good and the true? And both of them would agree that you can do neurological testing and you can chart the chemical electrical impulses that accompany all the things that go with moral um, feelings and actions. For Polkinghorne, though, Although he would say, of course, you can do that. He was able to look beyond that, to lift up his eyes and see that impulse, grounded as it was in physiological um, uh, uh, activity, that still pointed us to God. But for Shermer, his response was, you see, that proves it. All that really is, is. In other words, because you can hook hook yourself up to a functional MRI and trace these impulses in your brain function, that proves that all they point to are events in your brain. And so Paul, uh, Shermer is a classic example of what it means to look down. It's the stance that looks at human experience and says, well, all that really is, is, and then fill in the blank. In other words, we look down. So if you're a thoroughgoing Freudian, you look down. <laughs> the religious impulses that come over us are merely manifestations of our fear of death, our desire for sex, or the fraught relationships we had with our parents. 
If you're a Marxist, everything about your life, your relationships, your aspirations are all merely manifestations of the economic system uh, that you find yourself in. Much of social science explains why we do what we do as humans with reference to causal relationships between micro-level variables. And although that research gives us great insights into human behavior, and I am a fan, it tends to focus our attention down in the reductionism that says, see, here's all that's really going on. Sometimes as biblical scholars, we approach the sacred text by looking down, excavating our way through layers of form and genre down to the mythical or historical kernel. And again, that yields rich insights, and yet it can sometimes preclude our entertaining the, the tantalizing possibility that Paul Ricoeur suggested when he supposed that maybe these texts, after all, as odd and clunky and even embarrassing as they might be, could actually be pointing us to realities beyond themselves, to the God who is beyond naming. And even romantic literature and poetry can be reductionistic in its own way when it becomes merely an expression of the author's internal states of subjectivity rather than pointing beyond itself to possibilities of transcendence. And all of this represents the eclipse of transcendence. What uh, philosopher Charles Taylor says about modern citizens we find ourselves all alone in a flattened, imminent, mechanized cosmos. We have undergone what sociologist Peter Berger calls a secularization of consciousness in the sense that our, our fundamental way of being in the world tends to be a secular way of being. Our fundamental epistemological stance tends to be marked by a loss of transcendence, replaced by a reductionism that boils everything down um, to merely economic or psychological or neurobiological activity. Berger, of course, was a sociologist of knowledge. He emphasized that what we know, how we know, what we're able to know, all of that is tied to the social formations of which we are a part. We always know in community. We live within what he called plausibility structures. These are the social, cultural, epistemological formations that shape what we are able to see as plausible or believable. Now, in his book, Rumor of Angels, I highly recommend that book if you haven't read it, he says that, that if we were truly looking objectively at the data of human experience, there would be as much reason to look up as to look down. There are so many things that we humans do um, and experience that just don't make any sense apart from there being something or someone outside of this physical world. These are the rumors of angels from which the book gets its title, and it's a fascinating argument. However, he says, we live within a culture that, um, that tends to look down, um, a culture that says, all that really is, is. Berger captures that shift in this way. In the past, we thought we were engaged in a conversation with God. What we came to conclude was that this was actually just a conversation between man and man's production. We were just talking with ourselves. And what he's pointing to is a reality that that scores of sociologists, philosophers, theologians have addressed in a variety of ways, but they share this common thread. We live in a culture in which it is hard to pay attention. It is hard to be present to transcendence. And so what I want to do in um, this presentation is just draw on a couple of those that have been extremely helpful to me as I try to make sense of where that red arrow is on the food map at the Dallas airport. Um, as the foundation for that story, um, I'm going to draw on the magisterial work of philosopher Charles Taylor in his book, A Secular Age. Um, and I, I would mention that um, there are several writers, James K.A. Smith and um, Andrew Root, are both uh, people who have, who have really made that accessible to a much wider uh, population. So that's a good way into Taylor. 
Um, Taylor's careful to emphasize that when he talks about secularity, he's not just talking about the place of religion in the public square, how many people believe in God, how many people go to church. His focus is on the conditions of belief. How is it, or how was it that in 1500, it was hard not to be a believer? Um, it was hard not to believe in God. How did we get from there to where we are now, where belief in God is only one of option, one of many options, and for most, for many, not really even the best one? And his answer centers on what he calls the social imaginary that we live in and into which we have been socialized, and which is it's kind of like the proverbial water in the fishbowl. Um, if you ever see um, David Foster Wallace's little video, uh, This is Water, you know, the two fish are swimming and one fish says, the water's really nice today, and the other fish, and he throws in a little um, expletive, which I will leave out, but the other fish says, what's water? Um, and that's kind of what Taylor's getting at when he talks about the social imaginary. It's so close to us that it's just really even hard to see that it is a social imaginary. Um, so his account is dizzyingly complex, and so giving a detailed treatment is far beyond what I could do in this setting, if ever. Um, but I will note that he traces some of those early impulses to actually things happening in the Protestant Reformation. Um, but beyond that, um, uh, I want to call attention to the central theme, a central theme in his work, and that has to do with disenchantment the loss of transcendence, the rise to dominance of a view of the world that forecloses the possibility of a world outside of this material world. And the way Taylor captures this disenchantment is by describing what it might have been like to live in the year 1500 versus Western culture today. So if you lived in 1500, especially in the West, um, you lived in an enchanted cosmos in which uh, that included a, a spirit or a super, supernatural realm that is a realm beyond nature that was constantly impinging on the natural world. So you lived in a porous cosmos. Within this enchanted cosmos, the things in nature always pointed beyond themselves to what was more than nature, that is God. You had a sense that all things in nature had their own unique intrinsic value and meaning, their own unique internal perfection. And as we contemplate the perfection in their natures, we see the glory of God. It was like going through a cathedral, and especially those cathedrals that were like Salisbury that were built in a, a relatively short amount of time. Um, you can see all the dizzying array of all these different pieces of art um, where each piece is unique, perfect in itself, um, possessing its each, uh, each its, its um, unique internal perfection, what medieval theologian Duns Scotus called hexaity. And yet it also holds together in beautiful harmony. When you looked up, you saw beauty and order in the hand of God. In 1500, Taylor continues, it was a world charged with presences, a world open and vulnerable, perhaps to the demonic, but at least to influences beyond yourself. So artistic inspiration came to you from outside of yourself. Falling in love happened as a result of forces outside of yourself. It was a world, Taylor says, in which things could do stuff. <laughs> you had, uh, or stuff could do things. You had sacred places and objects, amulets, relics, love potions, the Eucharist, all with the capacity to act on you without your knowing, or at least without your full intention or understanding. Um, he will talk about why, in, in his account, why the priest had to start putting the host on the tongue of the worshiper because people would take it and they would uh, pretend to eat it and then they would slip it in their pocket and take it home to feed it to a sick cow. So the Eucharist bore this power, this efficacy, apart from the cow's spiritual state. Uh, things could do stuff, or stuff could do things. There was secular space, the mundane realm where you lived most of your life, where you did your work, but there were sacred spaces where the boundaries between this world and the supernatural world were especially thin, what some today have come to call thin places. 
You lived in ordinary time, that is, linear, mathematically sequenced time, where every minute and hour and day followed in succession one after the other. But at certain moments, you would slip into sacred time, the kind of time in which the typical temporal boundaries and distances somehow collapsed. So in your observance of the Easter vigil, you might actually be closer to the passion of Christ, which happened 1,500 years earlier than you were to the things that happened last week or last month. You lived with a sense of being surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, the communion of the saints. But you also lived with a sense of vulnerability, for in a porous universe, the sacred could break in at any moment. To be human was to be open to intrusion from the outside. Um, there was also the honoring of desire, our animality, uh, your physical impulses. For Taylor, this happened in the odd social event that he calls carnival, where you witness the overturning of the established order, where the king plays the jester and the jester is the king, and where you gave vent within limits to the impulses that lay underneath the surface for most of the year. On the one hand, uh, Lewis or Taylor says, this provided an opportunity to blow off some steam. So the, the carnival was kind of a safety valve. Um, but he says there also seemed to be this sense that these desires, though dangerous and easily out of control, are nevertheless good. They are the source of our energy and creativity. And so from time to time, we need to give voice to them to let them run free. And in all of this, Taylor emphasized, emphasizes that it was a naive enchantment. In other words, it just was. This was simply your world. It was the water in your fishbowl. And in that kind of world, it was hard not to believe in God. There were those who did not. There were those few atheists along the way. But for the most part, it was hard not to believe in God. Now, fast forward uh, to where we live today. Taylor says we live in an age marked by the shift toward interiority, to mind. And so what counts is what you are thinking and intending. Things in the world are not charged with inherent meaning. We bring meaning to them through the operation of our minds. Again, picture Lewis trying to conjure up a uh, spiritual fervor so he could worship God in response to abstract ideas. Whereas in an enchanted world, things could do stuff, now causation is centered in the personal agent. Taylor notes the shift from sacramentalism to personal faith. And again, he points that this was actually promoted by the Protestant Reforma Reformation, which highlighted personal faith, personal commitment. And this leads to what he calls the buffered self, where the self is insulated in its own interiority and where it possesses the autonomy to order its own life. It's also characterized by the dominance of instrumental reason, where before things have an intrinsic power, meaning, worth. Um, now they are, or at least for a while, they are simply tools that God can use as God wills. And so at first, he says, we see a shift toward a kind of providential deism. But eventually we realize that we don't really need God anymore. And so now things in the world have instrumental value within a mechanized universe. And so what we get is the buffered self alone in a flattened, eminent, mechanized universe. Among the most poignant parts of Taylor's account is what he calls the malaise of modernity, the haunting desire for more, the tendency to look around at the universe and say in the words of the popular song of Peggy Lee, is this all there is? So what Taylor gives us and what Berger adds from his perspective is an account of what it means to live in a modern secular culture within what Taylor calls a social imag imaginary, what Berger calls our plausibility structure, and especially our ways of knowing and our sense of what it means to be human, how deeply they are shaped by this social imaginary that tends to cut us off from transcendence, from the possibility that beauty might point us beyond ourselves to a loving creator of God. So now, I want to bring in a couple of other voices that round out this picture. 
uh, very briefly. First is a philosopher named Matthew Taylor. Uh, Matthew Crawford, sorry, mixing up Crawford and Taylor. Matthew Crawford and his book, a World, The World Beyond Your Head. Uh, the World Beyond Your Head. A little bit about Crawford. He's a really interesting character. He's a secular philosopher, a senior fellow at the University of Virginia's Institute for Advanced Studies in Culture. So he's a secular philosopher, lectures internationally, and he also runs a shop that fabricates custom motorcycles. So he is a motorcycle enthusiast who has his own shop, and he's also a philosopher. Wow, what a great combination. Again, uh, his account is dizzyingly complex. Um, I once had a group at Pepperdine, faculty, going, reading this book together. And the first question I would always ask when we get in the room, I'd say, so what do you think? And one of my colleagues said, well, I'll tell you when the book comes out in English. <laughs> so, um, but it's worth the effort. So um, Crawford opens up with a story of being on the bus in Seoul, South Korea. And of course, it comes with the constant barrage of advertising that most people have found ways to tune out with their devices and earbuds and so forth. But on this particular bus, he's riding along when suddenly a scent that smells like Dunkin' Donuts coffee gets squirted into the air right as the bus pulls up at a bus stop right in front of the Dunkin' Donuts as a voice reminds uh, the riders that there's a Dunkin' Donuts there in case anyone missed it. The ad agency that came up with that ad was given an award from its peers for, get this, the best use of ambient media. They won an award, Best Use of Ambient Media. Now that moment captures Crawford's concern about Western culture. In a way, Crawford is concerned about the atrophy of our capacity to pay attention. We live in the age of distraction. As humans, he says, we have a capacity for two different kinds of attention. One is stimulus-driven attention and the other is goal-directed attention. Stimulus-driven attention is the kind that's built in for survival. Something pops into your field of vision or hearing, it's almost impossible to turn away. And you can see how that helps you survive in a, in a you know, sort of a jungle. Um, when I teach this with students, I will kind of drone on at lecturing, and I have this colleague, good friend of mine, um, and I will have her, Beth Jarvis, you know Beth, um, delightful and a big hair, a big uh, head of, of, um, of curly hair, uh, so I'll be telling about stimulus and goal-driven attention, and then I, and at a certain moment, I have her stick her head in one of the doors and just wave, and everybody stops and they look up at Beth, because that's an example of you can't look away. And yet, goal-directed attention is essential for the things that make us human. To exercise goal-driven attention, you have to bracket out the stimulus, all the stimuli around us. And yet, if it's what, it's, it's, uh, it's what um, we have to have in order to do the things that make us human. Reading, learning, praying but also our capacity to, to discern meaning in our lives, to uh, construct a coherent narrative. For Lewis, this is the kind of awareness that is at the core of what it means to be spiritual. So Crawford says that we're losing our capacity for goal-driven attention. The attentional comments, as he describes it, is being taken over. We are constantly bombarded by stimuli that clamor for our attention. As an example, think about what it's like to be in the airport waiting area, waiting for you at the gate. Um, TVs typically blaring all around. And if you watch that, I once sat with a timer, you get a new image about every five to seven seconds, which is the optimal sequence of time to keep you glued to the set. And you watch people in that setting and they look like baby birds kind of kind of just looking up with this blank look on their face. Unless you are wealthy enough to have access to the lounge. I had a brief time, one brief shining moment, when I was teaching at Pepperdine and flying a lot, and I had this one time in my life I had enough uh, miles to go into the, the lounge. And it was amazing. 
Because there's just noise everywhere, and then you walk through that door, and all of a sudden, you're in a place of quiet and peace. If you can afford it. Now you pull up to the gas pump. For me, that's a point where I kind of think, and I, I start pumping the gas, and what do you get? There's a commercial jabbering at you. Social media, as we know, is structured to keep you from turning away. And what makes us especially vulnerable, uh, Crawford says, is that this is all happening at the very moment that we are seeing the full flowering of what he calls the radically autonomous, unencumbered self. This is the contemporary secular anthropology, and you hear echoes of Taylor here. The radically autonomous, unencumbered self. It's the view that says, I am the center of the universe. I am the standpoint from which all truth and morality are judged. I create my own identity and meaning. Freedom means I choose who I am and what I will be. I am the hero of my story. I invent myself. Nothing should get in the way of what I want to do or to have. Nothing should stand in the way of my fulfilling my desires. And it's everywhere, even in church. As theologian Andrew Root argues, the church can easily become just another cafeteria of resources where individuals come to get what they need to fulfill their personal identity projects. And here's the problem Crawford sees, what we Christians know fundamentally. It is not in ourselves to create our own identity, to direct our own steps. The reality is that we are situated selves. The self is in many ways a social construction. Our social environment tells us who we are and why we matter and what the good life is. Traditionally, we have relied on social institutions to help guide that formation, to help keep us on the right path. I would often tell audiences, uh, celebrated 42 years of marriage this summer, um, one of the reasons, not the only, but one of the reasons that I'm still married 42 years later is I always went to church. And I was always in an environment of people who honored marriage and people who held me accountable. And if nothing else functioned as a guardrail to keep me from going over and doing things I shouldn't do, the brethren were going to find out, and I was going to be accountable. Um, and, so, and so we have these social institutions that form us, and yet um, his concern is that we are seeing the demise of those social institutions. In the words of Harvard sociologist Robert Putnam, we are bowling alone. And for Crawford, there's really one institution that really has the knowledge and the data and the resources to get inside your head in that vacuum and shape your identity in its image, and it is advertising. And it's everywhere, in social media especially. One of the things that another sociologist, James Hunter, tells us is that for most uh, in, in the United States, he says, the only plausibility structure that has any hope of countering the pervasive influence of social media is the church. He says, as a sociologist, you know, we sometimes say it's the family. He says, the social, the, from a sociological standpoint, the family is a relatively weak institution compared to social media in the reach of advertising. He says, that the only thing I see that gives me hope is the possibility of the church. So Taylor and Berger give us a sense of how secular culture tends to eclipse the transcendent. Now, a fourth voice, Andrew Root, I've mentioned a couple times, written a number of books where he tries successfully, I think, to bring some of the insights from Taylor and others to talk about what it means for Christian life, Christian ministry, for the church. But what's striking is he has the same concerns. In his book, The Congregation in a Secular Age, which is the third book of a trilogy I highly recommend. He draws on the work of sociologist Hartmut Rosa to talk about the effect of technological acceleration, the speed at which we are seeing technological change, especially in the area of communication technology, and how technological acceleration leads to a rapid decay in social norms. 
Think about how, think about this. This blow, blows my mind. Just 10 years ago, maybe, if you were sitting across the table for somebody at a meal, and then one of those people pulled out a device and started looking at it, you would see that as the height of rudeness. But now it's no big deal. We do it all the time. It's just, so those social norms, the, the, the decay rate of social norms is getting faster and faster. There's this sense that we can't keep up. All the things we should be taking advantage of, uh, that advantage of that come to us through social media, all these opportunities, we feel like time is speeding up. Rose, Root would say we've lost our connection to sacred time. So, uh, so things are moving faster and faster and faster, and we feel that if we could just try a little harder, maybe find another hour in the day, we could get on top of all this. I could answer all of my emails. And of course, all this is happening in what Taylor calls the age of authenticity, where we're working so hard to invent, to curate a meaningful personal identity. This leads to what Root and others identify as the malaise of late modernity, and that's guilt. Exhaustion, we see it all around us. What Rosa called the fatigue d'être soi, the fatigue of being yourself. And again, he emphasizes how that cuts us off from the possibility of transcendence. And finally, very briefly, one last voice. German philosopher named Josef Pieper. In his book, little book, Leisure as the Basis of Culture. Leisure as the Basis of Culture. And when Pieper talks about leisure or leisure, he's not talking about living in the entertainment culture, which is too easily another, another form of distraction. He's talking about the cessation of work and how the cessation of work is essential for all the things that, in, in some sense, or for the things that, that um, give rise to creativity, attentiveness to beauty, all those things that make up culture. He originally wrote his little treatise in 1947 in the aftermath of World War II, during a period of feverish reconstruction in Germany. And he realized that it's possible to be so caught up in work that we lose our capacity for tending to and creating beauty. For culture, it's only as we have space in our lives to be still, to look, to reflect, that we are able to worship. And what I think Pieper brings to this conversation is the element of justice. It can feel like when we talk about beauty, we're talking about something reserved for the privileged. And in a way, we are. Only the wealthy get access to the airport lounge. And we can also feel a deep concern about the needs of those at the margins. We can act as if the goal is just to fix people's economic needs. As long as they have a place to live and food to eat, we're done. As if we could create a utopia by fix fixing physical conditions. Charles Taylor sees this as an attempt to find transcendence within the imminent realm. And what Pieper does is to bring those two together. And he reminds us that it is hard to pay attention to beauty. It is hard to lift up your eyes when you are a refugee running for your life, or when you live in a war zone, or an urban space where your life is in danger, or if you're a single parent who has to work 60 hours a week at a low paying job just to put food on the table, or if you have a chronic health condition and don't have health insurance, or if you can't afford to see a dentist. You see, maybe the reason why those things matter so much is that they block out our capacity for attention. If you are wealthy, the barrier to attention may be social media, the acceleration of, uh, uh, or the, the distraction of acceleration techno accelerating technology, if you are poor, 
It may just be the amount of time and work it takes to survive. But for both, it represents the forces that push against our capacity at this moment to be attentive to beauty, pleasure, to the possibility of resting in the presence of God. Now, the last thing I want to say, this is a pretty bleak picture, and so I leave you with the question, is there hope? Have we succeeded in completely eclipsing God? When you get to the end of Charles Taylor's massive volume, he says resoundingly, no, we have not. We are still haunted by transcendence. Beauty, the glory of God, they are still breaking in. Ruth says the same thing. God is still breaking in. God is still impinging on human experience. And so there is hope. And indeed, this is what I will emphasize in my final talk this afternoon. I think we see in Lewis a rich possibility for a gospel message that is winsome and that makes our hearts quicken in this cultural moment. And in that spirit, Taylor invites us into a kind of conversion, a conversion to the possibility of transcendence, to the possibility of lifting our eyes. And in the words of the poet Gerard Manley Hopkins, to look out upon skies of couple color as a brindled cow, to embrace beauty that is past change, and to cry out, glory to God. Amen. Thank you. We do have time for a few questions. If you have a question, if you'd like to come up here to the microphone and ask it, that'd be wonderful. Or an observation. <laughs> Problems, issue, conundrums, as I'm fond of saying in class. seems like Charles Taylor and Root and Smith maybe not necessarily are lamenting this idea of what we lost when we had this porous nature where everything was, you know, around us and we sensed it as something that's sacred. And um, but do we lament that now that we've lost all of that? Or do we recognize some of that was fear-based and not necessarily helpful? And... And part of that was the critique that got us away from it, even while enlightenment and all the other external forces caused us to uh, go away into that, um, that uh, not the porous, but the, you know what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's um, part of what's really kind of neat about, I mean, I think Root does this, where it's like, of course, we don't want to go back to that. There are things that we couldn't if we wanted to. So even as he talks about the congregation in this moment, there are realities for a congregation to survive. There are realities that you just have to pay attention to because of our context. Um, and, you know, I, I got here, it took 10 hours, but I got here from what would have taken weeks and weeks and weeks to get here. And I kind of like that, and I like penicillin. And so, you know, it's not that we would want to go back. Um, but I think there is a lament of some of the things that we lost in that. So maybe that's, and I, th I think Lewis does that as well. Lewis would say, of course, we don't want to um, go back to that. Um, and we couldn't if we wanted to. But part of what you see in Lewis, um, and there's a new book that's just come out. I think it's called The Medieval Mind of C.S. Lewis that actually um, argues that Lewis is very intentionally trying to bring some of those things forward from the medieval world that he, he feels like we're lost. So great question. I think, um, you know, I think the, um, as we begin to, uh, or at least the possibility of being more attentive to sacred time, um, that's something that Root talks a lot about. Um, so I think that, you know, I think those would be examples. Thin places, I think would be, you know, another possibility. Um, 
And I think the challenge is that, and, and this is a challenge that Root mentions, um, in an age of constant acceleration, the things that really form us take a lot of time. Things that form us spiritually take a lot of time. And so part of the challenge for a church is how do we do those things? You know, it's like years of living through the church calendar to really root that in our guts um, in, a, in an era where we're moving so fast. And so I think that's the, that's the challenge. We can't ignore where we are, but how do we, um, how do we find ourselves um, or how do we live into the good parts of that were lost? So I think that would be, it's a great question, yeah. Here you had one. I'll step over here. A actually, a couple of thoughts, Gary, and if you'd care to comment on either one of them, that would be great. Um, first of all, as I listen to so much of what you're saying about the new challenges of the company, technological acceleration, the rise of social media as a stimulus, attention you know, kind of phenomena, I, I couldn't help but to think back to the work of Marshall McLuhan and a lot of his work in media and Neil Post and since and the impact of hot media as cool media and culture, and we, we make our machines and the machines remake us. I don't know if, if you can align any of what you've said to that. That was just one thought that, that uh, I was thinking about as you were talking this morning. The other is just, uh, it seems to me this is also part of the story of the turn, the postmodern turn then, uh, as a response to the despair that accompanies the exhaustion okay, and the feeling of being overwhelmed in the midst of all of these challenges. But the postmodern turn and attempt to recover many pre-modern realities and recover the sense of what is lost in the midst of all this. So two very different thoughts, but if you want to talk about either of those, I'd appreciate hearing what you have to say. I teach a course um, for our beginning students in spiritual formation. And um, the very beginning of that course, we talk a lot about, I mean, kind of one of my mantras in that course is that we are formed by the micro level practices that we engaged in over and over again. Uh, you know, you are, um, even the way we set up rooms, you know, that your, your sense of, of the imagination of what the world is like um, and what is possible in the world, that is deeply formed by the practices and the, especially the social practices that we engage in. And, um, and so I, 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 oddly enough, need to talk with them about the way they read texts. And part of this is formed by, think about what you, how, what it's like to read when you're looking at a screen. You're not, you know, just like following line, line. You're, you're kind of doing this um, and you're picking out the pieces that are, you feel like might be useful or salient for you. Um, and so that's forming our practices of reading. And then it's happening within a culture that is um, dominated by instrumental reason that says things only have value as they, as I perceive that they have value for me. And, um, and so you, you, it's easy to read. I mean, that's how we, they read texts. I just start, you know, what's useful for me. And so we kind of have to recover a sense of uh, what does it mean to be hospitable to a text? You know, the practicing the hospitality of reading where you let this text come into your life. And I have them read, um, I have them read a little bit of some people who really they don't like. Um, and who, you know, there's a couple hard nosed, hard nosed people they read who are just like in their face and they don't like it. And I said, you know, can you, can you create a place at your table for this text? And then we emphasize that, you know, the thing you have to be careful about is um, the way that you're reading text may also form the way you see people. Um, and so there is something, uh, you know, there's, it's almost like a retraining in how we, how we encounter even things like texts. Um, and so I think that would be part of that, that first question is, and th there is something powerful about being able to um, account for, like um, when you name the symptoms, people get it. Um, I, I think about like, think about something like email. Theoretically, email should have uh, drastically eliminated the amount of time that we have to devote to personal correspondence. Did it happen that way? Absolutely not. I have, I think I probably have a couple thousand emails in my, and I just, I, you know, it's someday I'm going to go, I'm going to go, you know, process all of them, you know, and it's probably never going to happen. <laughs> um, and so, um, 
you know, when you begin to name the malaise, especially of guilt, um, where you think, I mean, there are all these things, I should be doing this, you know, I should be doing this, I should be doing this, all these things that are coming at, at me, and I see all these other lives of people that seem so glorious, um, and I can't keep up. When you name that for people, they go, yeah, that's my life too. And then if you can step up and say, now here, here's some of why that might be happening, that, I think that awareness opens you up to some, okay, and then I think then you're prepared for some practices that might um, might begin to um, take you into a different space. Um, when I was at Pepperdine, we would do a um, we do a weekend retreat. We called Unplugged, and we would take our students away for this weekend, and it was just focused on traditional, uh, historic Christian practices: Ignatian reading of Scripture, um, Lectio Divina, Visio Divina, some other, uh, you know, some other practices. Uh, walking the labyrinth, you know, if we were at a place that had a labyrinth. Uh, but the first thing, they, we had a little ceremony, the first thing where they would, they would turn in their phones and they would live the whole weekend without the phone. And then they would, we'd have a ceremony where they'd pick up their phones on Sunday after it was all over. And, um, you know, it was kind of hard. I'm just like, mm, you know, I'm like all of us. And yet um, that kind of deliberate practice opened them up to some possibilities. Um, so I think that, you know, um, I think some of, you know, naming the symptoms, in my experience, we typically go, yeah, that's my life. Being able to say, here's what, um, here are some possibilities, or here, here's why this might be happening, and here are some possibilities. The, w the one thing I would also say, and this is, um, this is Root's concern in the Congregation of Secular Age, um, Part of what happens for us, in, especially social media, he has this little section where he describes all these things that come out me that I ought to do. I ought to, you know, I have an accordion. I have an accordion in my study. I should learn the accordion, you know, and I should read the Atlantic so I can have good conversations with people. And, and I should read Dostoevsky. I need to read Dostoevsky again. You know, it's like all these things I ought to do to kind of keep up, and I just can't keep up, and I feel guilty. Um, and he says, churches fall into the danger of, if we could just do a little bit more, we could get ahead of this. And he says, that's a fatal mistake, because you're never going to get ahead of it. Um, now, you have to live within the culture, and yet, um, often the things that really call people into possibilities of living differently are you know, intergenerational, slow practices. Um, so I think recovering that, um, and I think maybe there's a hung. I hope there's a hunger for it. So, great question. You, you invited us uh, to uh, sense and. Uh, you have spoken to us, so our sense of hearing has been uh, tuned to you. Uh, you had us uh, smell, touch, and taste chocolate. Uh, earlier, you, you gave the example from Beekman, the two, two 12 year olds touch knees. And today's lecture was called Lift Up Your Eyes. In the course of your teaching, what have you said to people? who are visually impaired, who, who sort of navigate life through other senses, other than sight? That's, um, I would want to hear from those folks how this is our experience as a sighted person. What is your experience? How do you, how do you access that? So I guess that would be the, I would, I would do it as a question. Um, and, you know, what are the, what are the other possibilities for experiencing? I mean, I think, uh, you know, there is tactile pleasure. You know, there are tactile experiences that might come to us. So I think that would be, you know, the, the first, I guess my first question would be, okay, I'm describing this. What is your, what is your counterpart to that? Um, so because however it comes to us, it is, um, it, I think it comes to us in sensory, somehow in sensory experience. So it's a great question. Well, I th if those are all the questions for this session, uh, let us thank our speaker one mm -hmm. more time. 
And I would invite you back at 3 o'clock, about three hour or two hours from now, for the third and final uh, session of this day's uh, presentations. So thank you very much for coming. Grab a Hershey's Kiss on your way out. And then I mentioned this is the first one. I brought a few copies of the book. They gave me a good deal as they were clearing out their warehouse. So I'll pass that on to you for about 10 bucks. Um, and if you, if you don't have $10, just take one.